Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so most writers are uh, insiders and outsiders at the same time. Uh, I think, as, as I do almost every single day about James Baldwin, for example, uh, who is too gay for the black power movement uh, and too black for the gay rights movement, but was instrumental to both those movements. Um, Anyway, most people feel like they're insiders and outsiders at the same time, but I think writers feel it more, if only because we tend to notice it more or feel it more or just make a bigger deal out of it the way we do out of everything. And there's something like that uh, involved in the three novels of our guest tonight, Pamela Ahrens. Her first insider-outsider uh, was Jack Gorse, the protagonist of her first novel, The Understory. Uh, he's a lawyer who enters a Buddhist monastery and her second novel, The Virgins, uh, which is the most erotic book about people not having sex that I've ever read. <laughs> um, her protagonists are a Korean boy and a Jewish girl at a waspy, thinly disguised uh, boarding school in the, at the end of the 1970s, uh, in 1980. And in her most recent novel, 11 Hours, uh, the insider outsider is a pregnant working class white woman from upstate who gets involved in this disastrous love triangle with this pair of racially ambiguous, artistic, sophisticated uh, native New Yorkers. Um, and she has this radically different relationship with her labor and delivery nurse, uh, who's a Haitian immigrant, who also has issues of her own, uh, and is kind of an insider and an outsider. So these are three very different stories, but each one strikes me as being in some fundamental way about uh, not just insider-outsider relationships, but about the protagonist's body, about their control or lack of control, uh, not only over their physical world and their surroundings, but their own body. Each takes place within the context of this intense, uptight, sort of centrally scrutinizing institution. Uh, in Gorse's case, it's the monastery. Uh, in, in the other case, the case of the prep school kids, it's the boarding school itself, the institution. And then uh, most recently in the labor and delivery ward of a hospital, uh, which if you've ever been in is a really tightly controlled environment. Um, so within this physical setting, uh, this physical situation, there's, that's where Aaron's true subject is, which I, I guess is the metaphysical story which is of intense and private mystical transports. Um, you could call them altered states. Uh, the, the great Austrian novelist, Robert Musil, called them islands of consciousness uh, in his novel, The Man Without Qualities. Uh, Nabokov called it unreal estate. Uh, interiority, which is where I think uh, our guest tonight really shines, uh, shines the most. That's where you get not just flawless prose, but flawless consciousness, consciousness that, however filtered it is, is conveyed a, a, in a sort of a, a sacred way. She's good at conveying like those sacred daydreams that are more powerful than our reality, uh, our interior state, which is what makes her a master of fiction, because that's what fiction is, really. It's an interior state that is more powerful than our surrounding reality, and that's why it transports us. And each of these settings, each, each of these books has, kind of takes place around this sort of garden of sorts, somewhere kind of relatively uncivilized, where temptation and knowledge lie, uh, like most stories in Western civilization. For the Buddhist, it's the ramble in Central Park, where for decades men went to find physical release among the literal understory. Uh, for the prep school kids, it's this place called the bog, which is a secret pond way back in the woods where they go to smoke up and get philosophic and get laid. And for the pregnant woman in the middle of her 11 hour labor, uh, it's a beach, not a real one, but a painting of one that she discovers in a hallway that she's actually not supposed to go to. And she loses herself in this painting of a beach for an extended rapture uh, as though it were real. I bring all this up to make it clear that A, you should read all these books, and B, that they form a body of work, however different they are. Each part of this body has sort of a bit of the fable about it, almost the parable. Not because they're allegories or anything mechanical or cheesy like that, 
but because they're realistic. And, and Aaron's has this really natural understanding, not only of the world, but of the way that fiction works. Uh, these books are really tightly constructed and really tightly controlled only because like these boundaries, the sort of four walls, so to speak, give her and the reader the most, kind of yield the most drama and give a, our imagination the most room to play in. Um, not just hers, but ours too. She's got a knack of giving, for giving us, her readers, just enough specifics that we sort of make her story our own. And we're just so lucky to have her here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Pamela Ahrens. Dan, thank you. That uh, it was <laughs> that was the most sensitive introduction to my work I've ever had, and I I was sitting there learning things. I really was. <laughs> thank you. So yes, I'm going to read from Eleven Hours. Um, let's just see where I can put this fall uh, to set it up a little bit, and and. I should not forget to say thank you to Dan and Vu for extending the invitation to me to be here and everybody else who made it possible. I, I really uh, am very excited to be here. The novel takes place entirely during one woman's labor and delivery at a New York City hospital. Um, that's the title, 11 Hours. And it opens with a woman arriving at a hospital. Her name is Lore. She's 31 years old, and she's entirely alone. She has no spouse with her, no lover, no sister, no mother, no friend, nobody. And um, why this is so is gradually revealed. And you should also know she presents to the nurse assigned to her care, uh, to care for her as very angry, very kind of stiff and, and rebuffing of help, although she's clearly a, a young woman who needs help. And that, that nurse uh, assigned to her, uh, her name is Frankly, and she's the other main character. She's about the same age, and she's also pregnant, about 15 weeks along, but she hasn't told anybody this, not even her husband. And this is because she has a fraught history of pregnancy and, and birth, uh, about which you'll hear more in this excerpt. Um, Franklin's from Haiti, and she and her husband, Bernard, have been living in the U.S. for 11 years. Um, when she was young, she was kind of a, the equivalent of a, a midwife's assistant in her village. And the point of view toggles in the novel between the two characters, although in what I'm going to read, you're mostly going to get Franklin. Um, other things to know, when she first arrived, Laura was finding her contractions difficult to handle, and Franklin taught her to, that if she let herself use her voice very forcefully, kind of moan very loudly and deeply, uh, she could ride them out better. And that'll come up again in this scene. And Laura arrived with this very, very detailed birth plan, which has triggered differing reactions in different nurses in the maternity ward. Um, finally, there's a reference to a mambo, which is a priestess in the native religion of Haiti. And Kititha and Erzuli Mapiang are, are goddesses in that religion. Right before the part I'm going to read, Franklin has gone on her, on her lunch break. And she, another nurse has taken over for her. And uh, she's just returning from that break. The nurse in room seven puts down the magazine she's been reading and reports before going out that it's been 12 minutes since Laura's last contraction. And I'll also stop since many of you in the audience are young and may not have gone through childbirth. Usually you go to the hospital maybe when your contractions are five minutes or less apart. They don't really want to see you before that. Um, and, but sometimes you, you do come in and then everything slows down and you're kind of waiting around and things are taking a long time. That's what's happening to Laura now. Laura lies in her bed, unspeaking but restless. She laboriously shifts position and then a few minutes later shifts again. She breathes heavily. She says she wishes things would keep going. Yes, yes, says Franklin soothingly. What more can she say? She learned long ago never to make promises to a woman in labor. Fast labors slow down, slow labors become fast. Anything can happen and often does. Women who say they will never accept an epidural beg for the epidural, beg to be knocked out entirely. Babies twisted up in the umbilical cord, starved of oxygen for a little too long. Birthmarks obliterating a child's face 
absent fingers or toes. 50 hour labors, a mother suffering a heart attack while pushing. That one was only 32 years old, grossly overweight, yes, but seemingly <coughs> hale with an energetic, generous laugh. They saved her, but it was touch and go. And of course, there was Franklin's own child, three days old, he would never be more than three days old, who never once cried, but a few times lifted a weak half fist to punch the sky. Yes, yes, such a weak phrase. It needles her briefly with shame. Yes, yes, and no, no, those were the only two sentences she could bring out of herself when she first came to the States. I agree, I don't agree, I accept. I reject. The two elemental positions when everything else has been taken away. Those first weeks in New York, scared out of her ability to recollect anything in the Creole English textbook Bernard had made her study. Have you a book or some music, she asks Lore. Lore shakes her head. Well then, can Franklin turn on the TV? Another no. Franklin feels a flickering of exasperation. Why is there so much no in this girl? Why does she seem to take a grim pleasure in having nothing, no one, in refusing distraction or comfort? Franklin takes Laura's chart from the pouch beside the door and peruses it again. She removes Laura's birth plan and sits down with it at the computer desk. She scanned it first thing when Laura arrived, but is yet to read it point by point. The date on it is about six weeks ago, October 27, 2004. Laura has organized the plan under different headings. There are requests, interventions, in the event of a C-section, baby care immediately after birth, in the event that the baby is ill or handicapped, in the event that the baby dies. And so here's a little excerpt from her birth plan. In the event that the baby dies, I seek the following, to be able to see and hold the baby for as long as I wish, not to be given tranquilizers or drugs that blunt feeling, to arrange the funeral myself. Laura stares up at the ceiling as if searching there for the baby who may or may not arrive, who will probably live, but also might conceivably die. Franklin silently offers her admiration. Most birth plans specify that the patient wants a natural childbirth or hot compresses to reduce the chance of an episiotomy, wants to room in with the baby, and so forth. But the babies in these plans are never going to have deformed hearts or damaged brains. They are always going to be born with the right number of limbs. They are always going to survive. There is another form, a health proxy, tucked behind the birth plan. I, Laura Tannenbaum of New York, New York, being of sound mind. These instructions apply if I am permanently unconscious or conscious but have irreversible brain damage. I do not want mechanical respiration. I do not want tube feeding. Franklin flips back a few pages. Laura requests no Demerol. No Pitocin, no epidural, no supplementary bottles, no enema, no shaving. No, no, and again, no. I went over all of that with Dr. Elspeth Chang, says Laura. Yes, says Franklin. She returns the plan to its folder. Let's take a walk, she announces. It might get you going again. This may be true, but will more likely simply serve as a distraction for Laura. She adds, Having a child is usually just a long patience. How supple her speech is now. How she surprises herself at times. She's proud of her English. After 11 years, it is almost flawless. After that first fright, she took to it quickly, making her new neighbors, the ones of long residence, talk with her, correct her. Bernard said, you see, I told you. You have brains, quickness. You've got to study and get into school. Here, you could become a nurse. She stands close while Laura pushes herself off the bed, ready to lend a hand, but Laura is steady on her feet. The hallway is more brightly lit than the labor room, although the tan yellow linoleum floor has a sickly hue. Laura moves slowly now. They pass an empty room and then another, to which Marina, the charge nurse, assigned a 15-year-old shortly before Laura arrived. Often Franklin gets the teenagers because Marina knows she has the patience for them, won't lecture them when they cry that pushing is too hard, or eat ringdings and drop the wrappers on the floor. Franklin gets many of the difficult cases. She is seen as good with the obstreperous, the addled, the distraught. But this girl and her mother spoke mostly Spanish, so Marina gave the room to Alta. 
Franklin can hear the mother speaking to her daughter in a low, rapid voice, as if she has something urgent to impart before the baby's arrival. A whiff of fast food burger wafts out the open door, making Franklin queasy. Surely the girl can't be eating one. They walk. Laura stops for a moment to adjust her gown, which has gotten caught up between her legs. All day, the laboring and their caretakers trickle in and filter out and are replaced by different girls, women, husbands, mothers, sisters, friends. After today, Franklin will never again see this young woman with limp, must hair who has just exited room 11, Elmo slippers on her feet, heading towards the nurse's station, or the girl, 10 or 12 years old, about to become somebody's older sister or cousin, who is repeatedly filling a conical cup at the water cooler and dumping the water back down the drain. Franklin feels a helpless, pulsing goodwill toward all of them, tiny fragments of the great, whole, busy life of the universe that God, in his goodness, allows to unfold in her vision. Touching her cross, she passes the must-haired woman, the girl, and they dissolve back into the mystery of who they are and where they will soon be going. Outside a closed room sits a man wearing a Mets cap, his hands folded in his lap. Hispanic, probably Dominican, Franklin thinks, in his mid-twenties or so. Franklin greets him, and the man tips up his chin in acknowledgment. A muffled cry arises from within the room, and then right afterward, the patter of women speaking, comforting. The man stares at his palms and comes quietly to himself. Inside is women's work. The place for a man is out here. That has never been Bernard's style. Even that last time when Franklin was rushed here in premature labor at 22 weeks, Bernard stayed in the room for the whole messy, agonizing thing. At the double doors past a smaller nurse's station, a wall plaque displays an arrow to pulmonary. The station nurse nods to Franklin and buzzes them through. The corridor here, though it looks exactly like the one in maternity, has its own distinct and different atmosphere and smell, more vinegar, less sweat. It is emptier, more disquieting. Laura takes her time. About halfway down the first long line of doors, a clatter arises, and abruptly a wheelchair is beside them, with a man in perhaps his late 70s inside. Small, trim, with yellowed white hair, he turns to look at Laura with alert eyes. As the chair moves ahead, pushed by a young, dark-haired nurse, he twists back to keep her in his sight, and unexpectedly, Laura breaks into a responsive smile. In a loud voice, the man says, You'll be fine, dear. Okay, Laura replies. Her smile disappears, but she doesn't seem angry. Her shoulders loosen, her walk becomes more relaxed. The wheelchair reaches another set of double doors, and the nurse pushes through. Franklin watches as the soles of her waffled sneakers lift and fall and disappear. Then, Oh, says Laura. Oh, no. Right here, Franklin tells her firmly, and as, as absurd as this seems, as appalled as Laura is, she obeys. Right there on the old linoleum, she can feel its cracks and bumps etch themselves into the tender skin of her knees. She goes down and she remembers. She opens her mouth and her throat and urges out the great noise that mounts and crests and finally rolls back its force again. The external world disappears. All she hears is her own sound. She is a cave filled with a great echoing voice. When she is done, she closes her eyes for a moment, returning to herself. Franklin helps her to her feet. There are two elderly women standing opposite, gazing at her. One, in a hospital gown with a cardigan thrown over it, an arm covered with purple bruises, stares blankly. The other, dressed in slacks and a silky blouse, her still ample hair puffed around her temples and ears, holding her friend's wrists, wears an expression of distaste. She's in labor, Franklin explains calmly, and this articulation of the obvious makes the disapproving woman's eyes lose their sharpness. She tips her head in acquiescence and turns to her friend. She's going to have a baby, she says, as if the friend doesn't already understand, and perhaps she doesn't because she simply licks her lips tremblingly several times. Let's go back, says Laura. She feels a strange glee. She has flung her pain into this public space, not caring who observed it, whom she discomfited. This is possible, then. This can be done. But all the same, a reflective sense of embarrassment makes her turn from the two women and pretend she doesn't see them. There's something questioning in the fashionably dressed one's gaze that she doesn't want to encounter. Perhaps she is asking how Laura was able to do it, to release her pain so rudely. 
In childbirth class, Laura's instructor spent a whole day talking about the history of men's handling of women in labor, the withholding of pain relief, or dosing patients into oblivion, or putting them into restraints. Cutting tools that didn't need to be used, the shaving, the assault of the forceps. This woman is old enough to have experienced some or all of that. In her questioning eyes, her story of pain is spilling silently out. But Laura does not want to know that story. There's time right now for her pain only. Yes, they need to go back, but they will have to cross deserts and seas to return. It took them weeks to gain this distance. Laura is far away from rest. They turn toward maternity and frankly now allows herself to think of the odd twin she felt while Laura was down on the floor riding the contraction. She thought it might be a sympathetic effect, the absorption of a neighboring pain into her own body, but it continues as they make their way back. And now Franklin feels a sharp stab on the left above her groin. This next is a little excerpt from a, a pregnancy book, a typical pregnancy book. By week 15 of pregnancy, and Franklin is 15 weeks pregnant, by week 15 of pregnancy, your baby may suck its thumb. Eyes are at the front of the face, but are still widely separated. Franklin has seen the drawings and the sonograms and the uterine photographs hundreds of times, knows every detail of fingernails, eyelashes, crown to rump length. She learned these in nursing school, and she learned them too from the books she bought the last time she was pregnant. For over five years, she and Bernard did not conceive, though both believed it would happen eventually, that God would grant it to them at the right time, and then he did. But she lost that pregnancy at 22 weeks. First, there was backache, then the shock of her water breaking as she sat on the toilet, massaging herself against the pain. It took seven hours to deliver the fetus, which had a weak heartbeat and died as soon as the cord was cut. She was told later that the pancreas and liver were underdeveloped, not to mention the lungs. There had been absolutely no chance of survival. The imaging afterward revealed that Franklin possessed a bicornate uterus, a uterus split into two chambers. There was possible cervical insufficiency as well. What will be, will be, Bernard said, and he seemed to mean it. But Franklin covertly visited a mambo to propitiate Kitita and Erzuli Mapiang all the same. Six years passed, six years during which she finally put aside the idea of another pregnancy, and now here is a child inside of her again. The staff here, mostly kind and attentive, has been watching her closely. Young Dr. Roper hooked her up on Tuesday to one of the ultrasound machines and said, yes, the heart is beating. The head and limbs look absolutely normal. Terrific, Franklin. They will give her the best possible care, the best that is out there to be had. Some days she is sure this fetus will cleave to her long enough, will insist on being born with a healthy heart and lung and limbs, lungs and limbs. Other days she is equally sure she can feel its lack of will in the face of the odds, and she grows despondent. She does not wholly believe Bernard when he says, as he has over and over, that it does not matter to him, that he does not need a child. He is not truly as American as all that. Or perhaps it is she who cannot be quite so American. Her body once birthed a child, and ever since then it has ached to be a shelter again. It could be my last chance, yes? She asked Dr. McKenna, the high-risk specialist. She knew what his answer would be, but she wanted to hear his tones, his inflection. Perhaps then she would know how to adjust her expectations up or down the scale of hope. You never know, he replied. He was a professional. There was no inflection at all. But she knows that with every miscarriage, the likelihood of her ever having a healthy child decreases. The pregnancy has made her mean, made her small, Franklin thinks. On the subway and in the streets, she looks away from pregnant women, seven, eight, nine months along, so as not to poison them with her envy. The women who come into the labor ward are different. They are in their time of need. They are her charges, her children. But outside, she poisons the air with her resentment. When the subway train lurches forward, bringing her out of her post-work doze, she thinks for a moment that she felt the child move inside her, but of course it's way too early for that. Surely Bernard must guess, her diminished appetite, her reticence in bed. It is not right that she has not told him. The man was fashioned to be a father. Infants fall instantly asleep on his shoulder. Older children run to him with a ball or jump rope, knowing he will agree to play. He has prospects at work and will provide more and more for the household as he advances. But what is the point of more money if they do not have a family? What then had they come here for?
Dr. Roper told her, beautiful, a beautiful normal baby, Franklin. That was only days ago, but now the stabbing pain near the ovaries, shooting into the womb. When they return to the birthing room, Franklin tells Laura she must go to the restroom. She will be right back. Going to use the restroom, she repeats to Marina, who gestures to Carol to replace her in room seven. Franklin uses the bathroom farthest from the nurse's station because if she finds what she fears, she may cry out. She closes the stall door and pulls down her scrubs, her underpants. She already pictures the star-shaped print of blood on the cotton panel, but there is nothing there. She sits panting on the toilet, releases a trickle of urine that makes her feel she has gotten rid of some bad news. Her stomach unclenches. But this is just one moment of reassurance, and there are so many more minutes, hundreds of thousands of minutes, to get through before the baby can be born. May 31, that is the date if the baby lives. Franklin stands, flushes the toilet, washes her hands at the sink. The baby that never cried, that raised its fist to the sky, it scraped her out, made her womb unfit to carry any more children. That baby that was fashioned so easily out of the one time she let Martin stay inside her. He had insisted that pulling out reduced his seed, would shrivel him over time like a curse from Kitita. She was only 16, but she knew better. She heard a great deal from the laboring women she helped along. And nearly everyone knew if the man didn't pull out, you might get AIDS. But she let him stay that one time. Fatigue from fighting him, maybe. Maybe the sense of loneliness when the man's body withdrew so quickly and you felt the cold between your legs and the abrupt sense of separateness again. She was lucky her mother and father did not beat her or force her to become Martin's woman when she swelled up with his child. Most daughters would have suffered that. Martin with his unblemished skin, his slim hips, his pretty singing voice. She hadn't been fooled for a moment by his talk of love, of promising to care for her always. She knew he had other girls, but she was curious about pleasure and he gave it to her. Her parents did not force herself to tie her, did not force her to tie herself to this light-minded, unreliable, delicious boy. They disliked his family. Franklin's father knew something against Martin's father that he would never articulate, and they were content to bury the association. But the kindness and gentleness that had always been in her mother cooled and evaporated, and Franklin became like a guest politely tolerated in her own home. Her mother went through the dutiful motions of serving food to Franklin's plate, of reminding her to say her evening prayers. But her soft, murmuring patter dried up near Franklin. Her every gesture expressed shame that her daughter could not control her body, could not stay pious and clean. And Franklin's shame and her mother's shame spread deep into her bones and settled there like an ache. Perhaps that was when the baby inside started to die started its long process of dying that would be completed only outside the womb. Her mother's quiet disapproval and withdrawal was a death in itself, and Franklin's despair at it was tra transmitted, she is sure of it, to the child. She transgressed twice, first by making the child, then by giving it her despair, the despair that made it unable to live. And she has been punished, punished with a womb scraped of all the necessary ingredients for health and flowering. Yet, she hopes.